Assalamu alaikum. Ma'ashallah. Looks like a bunch of Muslims in here. Ma'ashallah. Whoa, that's scary, man. That looked look like a terrorist if I ever saw one. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa ala ali jamil muslimin, wa salatu islam, wa rasulah al kareem, wa ala ali wa sabi ajma'in, wa shahadu la ilaha illallah, wa shahadu muhammadin abduhu wa rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa ala ali jamil muslimin. Did you think this was going to be in English? <laughs> We can do that. That's no problem. No extra charge. By the way, did they charge you any money to get in? Huh? Was it free? Okay, then we offer a double your money back if you're not satisfied. <laughs> Just check it first. I would like to do one thing before we get into it too deep. Could I find out if there's any Muslims here? Raise your hand. Oh, oh, oh. Is there anybody here that's not a Muslim? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How do you like being surrounded by all these there? Uh, Muslims. <laughs> Scratch that. My name is Yusuf. Can you say Yusuf? Yusuf. Perfect. I don't know how they did that. You know, all these years my wife still has trouble. She keeps saying, useless. <laughs> Why is that so funny? Somebody has a speech in peppermint? Anyhow, yeah. So what I like to do is modify our talk for today. We're, we have the subject. Thank you, sir. There we go. We have the subject here. It says, Yusuf asked this in Jesus. And what I like to do my talk is the message of Jesus. I'd like to just, if you don't mind, I could just like add a little something to that. Not take away, but add a little something to it. And tell you how the message of Jesus helped me to see a better way to look at religion in general. And specifically a better way to look at Islam. Is that okay? Thank you so much. Because otherwise I was going to do it anyway. Don't the pigs, you know how they are. Alhamdulillah. The praise is to Allah, and we thank Him so much for everything that He gives us. The message of Jesus is one of love, of peace, of cooperation, and of hard work. A lot of times we miss some of these important ingredients when we're talking about the lives of the prophets. Another thing that we miss a lot of times, although we should assume it, is the integrity with which they came. Each and every one of the ones that were selected by Almighty God to represent His message have some amazing things about their character. And these things are indisputable qualities and indisputable traits and characteristics that not only they are required to have to be a prophet, but also, there's the same kind of qualities and traits that you and I should seek to go after and follow. So that means that a prophet must be a role model for his people. And as such, growing up in a Christian home, I was exposed to the Bible and the message of Jesus on a very constant basis. When I was at my grandmother's, when I was at either one of my grandparents' homes, all religious people, and maybe they have a little different take on things, you know that, how that happens, but for the most part, everywhere I went, I was exposed to religion. So it was normal for us to talk about God, talk about Jesus, talk about the Bible, and talk about what that's supposed to have an effect on us or an impact on us as human beings. It wasn't until we moved from the north, we used to live, you know, we were from Cleveland, Ohio. It wasn't until I moved to the south and found a whole different take on everything that I saw that there were uh, people who weren't all that religious, let's say it like that. You know, Texas, anybody ever heard of Texas? Huh? Heard of Texas? Okay, now you get the idea. All right, this is 
<laughs> or another way, just bush. Okay, now you got it. All right, that's okay. Alhamdulillah, that he dried out before he became president. I want to do just emphasize that because although I don't claim to be a good person, that's another story, but I know what a good person is supposed to be. And there's no doubt about that. I know exactly what I should be as a person believing in God and supposedly following God's message. The message that comes with Jesus Christ, peace and blessing be upon him, is one that has been explored to quite an extent by the Muslims, even more so than some Christians, looking into who is this person of Jesus, and what was it that makes him special, and how do we understand him, and how does he influence our lives. And, well, of course, Jesus is the center of attention and affection of the Christian religion, it's interesting that there is so much attention also and uh, devotion really to the message that he brought in Islam. And without going into too much detail on it, but yet being able to convey at least a certain idea behind it, I would like to talk about Jesus from the comparative views of both the Quran and the Bible. Before I do that, there are certain words I always like to give, I think, a better understanding about, so that we don't assume what these words represent. Now, I'll start with Bible. The word Bible is not in its perfected term. It is uh, a, it's a shortened version of, a, of the word in Kone Greek, Biblios. And they dropped the O-S, and O-S became Bible. So instead of Bible, or uh, instead of Bible, it's Bible, all right? And it literally means book. And that's important for Muslims to know that. Bible is book. And of course, you, I think, all know that already. But let's look at the word Quran. How many know exactly what that word really means if we bring it to English? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Quran, what is it? Exactly. What's your name? Andrew Abdullah. Andrew Abdullah. Yeah. AA. Yeah. Oh. I'm Andrew, but I like to myself Abdullah as well. Whatever you like, I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> In Texas, we just say, don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, and you had the right answer. Recitation is the best way to describe it. The first word that came to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, while he was in the cave of Hirad on the mountain of life, Jabinur, when Jibril, the angel Gabriel, came to him, excitedly embracing him, releasing him, and commanding him in the Arabia, Ikara! And the response, Fafala, Ma'ana Bikari. So here's the angel telling him, Ikara. What does that mean? Who knows? Let me hear it. Read, read, recite. Oh, I heard two different words. How many say read? How many say uh-uh? No, it wasn't read. You guys are outnumbered. Only a couple of you guys. Huh? What was it? You think? How many think recite? Okay, you changed your mind. You should have held up two hands. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at it. If someone recites the Quran, what is he called? Qari. 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 No, that's if he memorizes the Quran. Pay attention. Okay? Qari is a reciter. Quran is, as you said, Abdullah said, recitation. Recitation, reciter. Iqara means... And the response, I am not a reciter. 
from Papa Muhammad Sallallahu to the end of the So let's stay together on this. Okay. So Quran is recitation, Bible is book. Bible, book, Quran, recitation. Why is that a big deal? Because that's how the message came to us. What do we know as as a Christian here in this room right now? What do you know about Jesus that you didn't get out of your Bible? What do you know about Jesus that you didn't get from your Bible? Did you read it in an encyclopedia and where did they get it from? A dictionary, where did they get it from? How do you know anything at all about Jesus except you got it from the Bible? And if you said, well, sort of, kind of, there's something in the works of Josephus, blah, blah, blah. I will tell you, if you know the real history of the translator on that, you'll know that that chapter was added. That is not from the original works of Josephus. So, the only thing that we have that is textual evidence about Jesus is from the Bible. Except what? Except the Quran. Because the Quran gives us some very clear statements about Jesus Christ. Oh, wait a minute. What about that word Christ? How many Muslims say, mm -mm, don't say that. Just say Jesus, uh, Jesus the prophet, Jesus his majesty, something like that. Huh? What? Is it, can we say Jesus Christ? Or, how many say, no, that's not so good? You shouldn't say that. One, two, three. Yeah, shouldn't say that. Four, five, oh, shouldn't say that. Are you sure? What does Christ mean? Messiah. Oops. Uh oh. I love that look. I wish I had a camera on you right now. That look like when you were oh. Because well, how do you say Messiah in Arabic or Hebrew? Messiah. So we shouldn't call Jesus that. Uh, what did Allah call him in the Quran? Let's say. Oops. That was beautiful. <laughs> that reaction. <laughs> you need any medicine or you're okay? All right, cool. Moving right along. <laughs> yeah, we're learning something, you know. A lot of people think I came to educate Christians about Islam. Well, guess what? I'm educating myself as I go and hoping that we're all learning something every day. And one of the things that we learn is there's a lot more in common between a real Christian and a real Muslim than you might suppose from what we hear in the real news. <laughs> How many of you think the news is absolutely 100% accurate on everything they say? Huh? Anybody? Yeah. No? Do you believe? Huh? <laughs> you believe the weather too, right? <laughs> it's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow, right here in Middlesbrough. Yeah, right. <laughs> Get your umbrella ready. I think that they're more accurate with the weather or predicting the outcome of the sports than they ever were in the other so-called news that we get from them. And while we're on this subject, i got another subject real quick I want to talk about. Let's talk about history. Now, this is in history books, so therefore it must be 100%. Isn't that true? It's in a history book. Huh? American history, for instance. I mean, we're here in a place, what, what do you call this place? Uck? Oh, that's right, you just spell it. UK. But anyway, you like that, huh? Ook. Anyway, <laughs> I just good laugh you got going up there. I think some of you guys will be on the road. I need to beat it up on the deal there. Okay. So anyway, we're here in Ook, and uh, in America, in our history books, we talk about those Ook people very frequently, mentioning how they were so oppressive and how we had to go to the New World and found it and break away from their horrible taxation. Ah, one of my ancestors, by the way, this is a true story. My mother's great, great, great uncle was Samuel Slater. Anybody ever hear heard of him? No. You don't know. But in America, he's famous. Why? Because before he came along, all of the product that came out of the soil, all of the cotton and anything that was going to be used for 
even uh, barley and wheat and things like that, had to all be shipped back to Uk, or actually called the bridge shops that time, and had to be shipped back over here because they didn't have any processing of anything, they didn't, especially not mills, no cotton mills, no gins, no, no way to do anything but send all of the cotton, send the wool, send everything back here, textile mills, got it? And it was illegal for anybody to draw, back then they didn't have the little cute little phones you could go, you know. So if you drew any pictures while you were in any of the mills, you would be in trouble. Big trouble. So what he did, he memorized everything. He would go. What they call photographic memory. And he had it. So when he was coming across on the boat, that's when he drew it all out. And when he got to what's called New England, he produced it made a few bucks out of it, and now they make libraries and schools and streets and everything, Slater. And even in the neighborhood where I grew up, his name is on one of the streets there. So, he's famous over there. That's our kid's story. But what about over here? If they could have caught him over here, what would they do? In Texas, we call it a necktie party. Yeah. Because that's a traitor. That's industrial espionage. And taking the secrets of a country over. Them. And then after that, of course, we didn't meet, and that was easy for us then to go in the revolution against it. So I think you understand the importance of history. It depends on who's telling the story. Whose story? His story. Now you know where the word came from. So this means really, and we talked about the news, talked about history, mentioned a few things from Christianity and from Islam. What do we see from this? We see that a person should use their own mind, research and find out more information before you make a big mistake. A mistake is when you talk to people and they find out you don't know anything. A bigger mistake, though, is when you make life choices and later you think, man, man. And it happens to women a lot. You know, this thing about life choices, and they think back later, mm, should have married that other guy. <laughs> but seriously, though, now we're ready for me to tell you what happened. Some couple decades ago, to a good old boy from Texas. My father came home one day from his shop, and he said, Son, I got some good news for you. I said, all right, what is it? He said, we're going to be doing business with a man from Egypt. I said, okay, that sounds good. Egypt? You come to Egypt? Or are you talking about Egypt, Louisiana? This is the place. And he said, no, 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 man. This is... I said, all right, this, this sounds good. And I'm thinking, you know, the pyramids, and Abu Hub, and you know, like this, and the Nile River. This is great. You can just imagine how the business cards, the stationery is going to look. Some, you know, he's going to import, export, because that's what he wants to do. I said, this is a good deal. And then he said, oh yeah, and he's a Muslim. Oh, what? He's a Muslim. Oh, man. Dad, these guys are Muslim terrorists, kidnappers, hijackers. They don't believe in God. And the feet stink, stink, and I don't want nothing to do with them. <laughs> I just think that anymore. Anyway, my father said, no, he's really a nice guy. I want you to meet him. And, you know, and he insisted. I said, okay, but it got to be on my terms. What are the terms? I have to meet him on Sunday, the Lord's Day, coming from the church, and I'm not going to eat first either. Right? Because normally, after church, you go have the big meal of the week right then. But, no, we go in straight up. And I'm going to have my artillery with me. I'm on, number one, I got my Bible right here. I got my cross. I had a cross about A B. And I got my hat. Jesus is Lord. I'm ready to meet him. Bring him on. And I know what they Muslims look at. They got this big turban all over their head and long robes on. You know what I'm saying? 
got this giant beard, got critters in there and everything. And then he's got an eyebrow that goes all the way across. Probably got a geiger, you know, conja. I'm looking for a pilot for me. You know? So when my father introduced me, he said, this is, uh, his name is Mohammed. This is Mohammed. I said, where? This guy. He didn't have no beard. He didn't have any long dress on. He didn't have it. He was wearing normal clothes. In fact, he didn't even have any hair. It's all hidden. So this guy can't be a Muslim. Can he? This is in my head, of course. When we shook hands, it's a nice guy. Oh, well, let me get straight here, because I've been watching Pat Robinson on the 700 Club. I don't know if you know that, that kind of TV over here. This man is trashing Muslims by the second, you know. So I asked him, uh, you guys don't believe in God, do you? He said, no, we believe in God. What are you talking about? I said, yeah, but you don't, you don't know about Adam or Abraham and that. He said, yes. You believe in Abraham? He said, yes. Like the Jewish. He said, no, even more so. So what do you mean? And he began to... We're losing something here. We go. He began to tell me what Muslims believe. And I was shocked. In fact, he's a descendant of Abraham by way of Ismail. And, and if you know the Prophet Islam had a daughter, Fatima. And those, they followed the genealogy. And this man is from that. He's like, huh? I'm asking him if he knows about his own grandfather. Whoa. Then I asked him about Moses. Yeah, you know about Moses. Ten Commandments, yeah. Whoa, wait a minute. Went over a few more things, and I, I came to the point. And this is our point today, of course, is Jesus. But you don't believe in the precious name of Jesus. He said, yeah, I do. You do? But you don't believe he's the Christ. That was our point a little earlier, wasn't it? He said, yes. So you do. Miracle birth? Yeah. Immaculate conception? Yeah. Miracles? Even brought a dead man back to life? You said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah? He even predicted one to come after him, which will be the spirit of truth, the comforter. <laughs> you don't have that? He said, yes, we do. Oh, really? Uh -huh. So, uh, what about the Holy Spirit? He said, what? You know, Holy Spirit. He said, yeah, we do have it. Wait a minute. I said, okay. Where is Jesus right now? He's with, he's with the Lord. Really? And he said, he'll be back in the last day. I said, okay, that's it. I can convert this guy. Easy. Uh, so we began doing business. For the next three months, we spent a lot of time traveling together and dialoguing back and forth. And no matter what I would come up with as an idea, I found he could top it with something else to make it even better. And we enjoyed each other's company a lot. We did. In fact, I got used to him getting up for his prayers, you know. And to the extent that we would actually go down and knock on his door. He stayed in our house with his brother. And knock on his door and say, Mohammed, did you do your prayers yet? Yeah, okay, just check it. <laughs> did you dry off the sink? <laughs> yeah. anyway, because uh, I think you know Muslims when they get ready to pray they like to play with the water quite a bit first <laughs> try to tell them about that anyhow it came to the point though that although I was very convinced that what he was saying was true I had a problem dealing with it because how am I going to explain to a congregation that I face every week about this subject. By the way, I was a music minister for our church, but that was not where I did preaching. I had a, an organization we used to meet on Wednesdays, and it was, a, it was a religious gathering for any denomination wanted to be together, and I used to like to go there, hang out, talk with them. And I was worried, if I say I become a Muslim, what are these guys going to do? Because all of us were hooked on 700 Club. All of us watching these preachers give us this line of whatever. And then a strange thing happened. 
Another preacher friend of mine had a heart attack and was in the hospital at the Veterans Association in Dallas. So I would go over and visit him every day. Another person was in his room with him one day, sharing a room there. And I decided to pull out my Bible and, you know, give him the conversion stuff. Trying to get him to wake up to Jesus and what I thought was the message. And the man would not respond. I'd ask him, you know, where are you from? He said, Venus. There's a Venus, Texas, by the way. But uh, I could see he meant something else. And I started, he was in a wheelchair, and I would take him around, push him outside and stuff, and try to witness to him, is what we call it. And I had my Bible, I tell him the story of Jonah and the whale. How many of you know Eunice? You know Eunice? Yeah, that's Jonah and the whale and the hood and what happened, and uh, the story. It's the same story. Except that in Islam, we know how he got out of the way. So, let me tell you that little story. I found this out after I was getting into Islam. When Jonah's in the way of the sea, God would have left him there forever had he not said these words. La ilaha illa ante subhanahu and brothers and sisters in Islam, brothers in faith, and brothers in humanity, listen carefully to the meaning of these words. Because if you ever get in a situation like Jonah, you feel like there's no way I can get out. My problem is not only encompassing me, it's digesting me. Try these words. La ilaha illa ante any country in the The meaning of it in English is that there is none to worship except you alone, O oh God. The majesty and glory is to you. And verily, I'm the one who did the wrong to myself. That means with those words, Guaranteed or put you out of any difficulty you've ever had. That belief in that one God, turning to Him and admitting to Him, you don't have to tell your, your whole story to everybody, you know what I'm saying? But you admit to Him and, and then ask Him, get me out of this situation by any way you will. You will be surprised. I've used it myself. We always advise anybody who's going for Hajj or Omer to memorize this because when you get in your difficulties which you will be in this will help you so much and it's said many times as you're circumambulating around the Kaaba whether you're making Sai between Safa and Marwa whether you're out on Arafat wherever you might be these words precious words and they're in the Quran this is what the prophet Jonah Eunice said but come back to our story when I was trying to share some story with this gentleman in the wheelchair, he said, finally he looked up at me, and he almost had tears in his eyes as I was sharing the story with him. He said, I want to apologize to you. I've been hard on you these days. And, you know, you're just trying to share the word. And I said, it's okay. And he said, no. He said, I got something. I know you're preaching and all. He said, I got something I want to confess to you. I said, stop. Hold on. I'm not Catholic and I'm not a priest. I don't do confessions. You know, priests do confessions. He said, I know you're not, because I am. I came to know that that was Father Peter Jacobs. And when he got out of the hospital, I invited him to come out and live at the house too. Because I felt like, you know, we got the Protestant thing going, we'll get the Catholic thing going. Well, we're going to get that Muslim. <laughs> I had it figured out. But Allah had something else figured out. <laughs> I want to keep the story short because it's not really our story. Now we're talking about the message itself. But as I was riding out to our home the night that I picked up Father Jacob, Father Peter, took him out there to the house, we started talking about religion and I wanted to get his take on Islam if you know anything about it. And he stopped me cold and he said, you know, as a priest, we all had to study Islam. I said, what? He said, yes. Catholic priests study Islam. Huh? Did you know imams don't have to study other religions? 
But priests, they do. They know what's going on. So he started saying things that is exactly what I was hearing from the Muslim. And I actually said it in a positive way. One God, believing in the Ten Commandments, believing in the miracles of Jesus, believing in Jesus coming back in the last day. I'm thinking, whoa! Some Muslim worked this guy over. <laughs> what happened here? He even talked about the Quran in a very positive light. Except that I have to tell you, in Texas we call it Koran. K-O-R-A-N. Koran, you know. But anyway, when we were out there at the house, I figured, okay, this is how we're going to get this guy. You know how? What we do is sit around the table, and then what we're going to do is make it so that we can present our case one way or the other about what we believe. We bring down the Bibles, right? And my father has a Bible. I had a different Bible. I got the Revised Standard. Dad has KJV. My wife had the one by Jimmy Swagger called Good News for Modern Man. And then we got a problem because our books don't line up too well with each other. Different versions, different chapters, different numbers. But then all of a sudden, when you bring in the Catholic Bible, the Reims Due Bible, you got a new problem because that's got 73 books. Ours had 66 books. Those don't match up too good. And I'm looking over at the Muslim, he's sitting there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this did not go well. Uh, uh, Mohammed, how many uh, different versions you got of that Koran? He said, there's only one. It's in Arabic language, and it's all the same everywhere on earth. One and a half billion people today have Quran, and it's always the same. There's not a difference in a single dot, jot, or iota anywhere in it. So you're like, uh, hmm, that's pretty tough. As a matter of fact, we just changed the subject. The next night, we'll come up with another subject. I said, let's talk about God. After the dishes are cleared away, we we'll sit around, have some tea. Talk about God. He said, you know, I always wanted to ask, could, could you, you guys believe in one God? Yes, of course, we're famous for that. We're the Christians. And, okay. He said, so um, how do you explain Trinity? Um, what? The Trinity, how do you explain that? Well, uh, of course, you know, everybody knows the Trinity. So it's got one or three. No, 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 no. Whoa, hold on. It's one God, and He's God. And Jesus is one. Okay, God is one, the Holy Ghost is one, and it's not like one plus one plus one, it's like one times one. Ah. Times one times one. I said, well, it's still only one. Yeah, that's right. So where is Jesus and the Spirit? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, so I went to my friend, the preacher, the next day, and I said, hey, I got this Muslim. He said, I told you to stay away from the Muslims. <laughs> You're going to get a demon, son. I said, no, 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 no. They're cool. Uh, they're cool. No, stay away. I said, no, no. I was trying to tell him about Trinity, see, and I told him, he said, you should have told him about the apple. Oh, the apple, yeah. And let me go back and do that. So I go back, right? That night, I have, okay, so, you know, we talked about the Trinity. Trinity, okay. The apple has the, the red, you know, on the outside of the apple, the skin, and then inside the part, you eat the white part. Inside of that are the seeds. Three things, one apple. You guys count the seeds? <laughs> what if you got a worm in it? You got one? Uh, okay. Uh, it's an A on that. Let's uh, back over to the preacher next day. Listen, uh, let me know. He said, I told you, man, you got to get a demon. Stay away from the Muslims. I said, no. Because I tried the apple. Forget the apple. Tell me about the egg. The egg. <laughs> well, you know how that works, babe. Okay, you got the white on the outside. You got the, the shell, then you got the white on the inside, huh? The, the white part, and then inside of that way you got yellow. Yellow, white, shell, all three, one egg. Yeah? He said, what if it's a double yolk? <laughs> That's a problem, isn't it? A double yolk? Uh, what if it's rotten? It's a problem. And then again, I'm looking over at him, and he's sitting there. Uh, well, how, how do you guys explain God? And look what he said. I never forget this. Oh, who Allah has been. 
الله سمعه لم يبد ولم يبهر ولم يقوله قوان أحد The meaning Say he is Allah the one, uniquely one eternally sought after by his creation while he needs them not He's not the father of anybody nor the son of anybody He is not like anybody He is uniquely one Whoa. And that had a tremendous impact on everything that we were saying and doing at that time. Because the priest then decided he wanted to visit a mosque, and he did. When he came back from the mosque, we asked him, what are they doing there? Do they like slaughter animals? Are they making bombs? He said, no, he said they stand and they pray like monks. I said, oh, really? He went back again. And that time when he came back, he was wearing a white robe and a little goofy hat on. And I said, Father Jacob, Peter, what happened to you? You become a Muslim? He said, a shadow Allah, he led a little ball. A shadow of Muhammad Rasulullah. And you know there was such an impact that my wife and I had a discussion of which I figured she also is interested in Islam. And then I figured, okay, what can I do? When I started talking to my friend, he said, this is not about you and me, you and your wife, or you and your father. This is about you and your Lord. Go talk to him. And I went out behind my father's house, and I found a place that I figured is private, you know? And I put my head down on the ground, and I couldn't think of anything to say other than these two words. Guide me. Today we find that Muslims are all saying this 17 times a day. Ihedina, Ihedina, guide us, guide us, guide us. That was what woke me up. And when I raised my head up, I realized that's the true message. The message of Muhammad, the message of Jesus, the message of every single prophet who ever called to Almighty God. Open up your mind, open up your heart, knock, and it will be open to you. And this is what needs to be opened, the heart, the heart. Give the heart over to the Lord. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity with God, and peace with God, and all of that together. That one big, beautiful concept I just delivered to you right there. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace can be said with one word in the Arabic language. Would you like to know what it is? Islam. Do Islam. And you'll be in good shape with your Lord. That's the message. That's our program. And now it's time for the Muslims to begin to prepare to stand in connection or sila or salam with their Lord. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're just going to break now for um, half an hour. Um, there's some refreshments outside. Uh, brothers. Uh, we're going to get started in just a second. As soon as we can locate one of our pieces of equipment went missing on us. It looked like this, but it was supposed to have red tape on it. I don't know where it went, but we can't do anything without it. Ordinarily, by the way, ordinarily, uh, they have microphones, they pass them up in that, but we wanted to take advantage of our time because we've only got about 30 minutes. And when you do the microphone bit, you only wind up answering three or four questions in that time. 
we're going to try to handle at least double or three times that many. And how we do it is you just write down your question and get it up here as quick as you can before we get started. So please, any question, try to keep it brief. Don't tell me your life story. Please don't do that. Thus, what's the question? The questions start with what, where, who, why, why, and they don't ever start with I. All right? Thank you so much. like to uh, uh, if you'd like to think, think of some uh, fault provoking questions inshallah um, basically on the topic if we can stick to the topic that would be much appreciated who forgot that questions don't start with the letter I <laughs> I was having a discussion okay I just need to question guys Yeah, there's the question. There we go. There we go. Watch. If you email this like this, probably it's never going to get an answer because we don't have time. When you get a thousand a day, we'll have to all work together trying to go through and sort them out. So if you can get to the question, okay, without the history, it's better. Thank 
you got to do. That look okay? Bismillah. We'll get started now. We have some questions. Our program that we talked about was the effect that the message has on people. Now we talked about the message by way of Christianity and the same message by way of Islam. And what's the difference? And we mentioned that a Catholic priest had accepted Islam. And we mentioned that I also accepted Islam. That in itself, though, is not a proof that one is better than the other, because people have, they're subjective, they're, they've got their own reasons for what they do. Maybe it's because, uh, you know, the, the bribery that Muslims always offer you a lot of money to join Islam. <laughs> or maybe not. Or maybe it could be that you don't really want me to start over, do you? Please don't do it again. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Our program was dealing with the subject of the message, the message and how it has effect on people, whether it's coming from Christianity, from Jesus, or from Muhammad, salam. And we said that a Catholic priest accepted Islam, and we said that also myself accepting Islam as a Protestant. And then one thing we should be aware of, though, is just because some people accept the religion, or to leave a religion doesn't necessarily mean that that's a proof that one is better than another. Ever since the beginning of religions, people have been changing their mind. In, out, around, up, down, and all around, in and out of the same religion, etc. Some people will leave religion, become an atheist, and then go back to another religion. And I've seen that happen myself. So how can we, each one of us, Take something home from this tonight that will benefit us. And what we mentioned at the end of our program, we talked about the opening of the heart. What Islam really teaches us, no different than Christianity, is that there's one God, service to Him, following His will on earth, as it is in heaven, is exactly what God expects of us. We have to be kind to each other, generous to each other, understanding, tolerant. And we must also have respect for each other, regardless of the choices other people make. The respect still has to be there. Now, this is not different between these two great religions. It has been my posture on this subject that the two religions have a lot in common, more so than any other two religions on the planet. Together, Christianity and Islam make up almost half of the population of the earth. And that's something really incredible. When you consider, what is it, six or seven billion human beings walking around on this planet, and you're saying about half of those people are accepting that there's one God, accepting Adam and Eve and the story of the beginning of the whole thing, accepting Abraham and Moses and David and Suleiman by name. You got somebody in your control book that knows what they're doing? Which one you want to turn off? Alright, but now you can't hear me. Yeah. Can you hear it just fine? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't have to get down here close to it. No. <laughs> In that case, we don't need to leave it hanging there either, do we? Bismillah, alhamdulillah. We we'll just go right to the questions. That's it. We got a question here. It said, "Should we believe the doctor if he tells us we have six months to live?" There's no way he can know that. You might get hit by a car tomorrow. <laughs> That's a good guarantee, actually. If you promise me. Why do Christians drink wine? Probably cheaper than beer. <laughs> Is there anything in the Bible reference to this yet? Yeah, says the first miracle of Jesus, he made a whole lot of wine for the people at the wedding. For the use of, like, people, just push the mic a bit forward. I think it'd be a lot more cleaner. He said it was fine. <laughs> huh? I can't hear you. My ears are not coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bull. Don't be leaning down doing like that. You okay now? Hear me now! <laughs> we're getting to the cool this thing. We're done there. What advice do you give somebody who wants to embrace Islam but they're scared of what their family would say? Why would you embrace Islam anyway? Why? What would be the reason to embrace Islam? Tell me. Why? Why would somebody embrace Islam? Why? You know why? Your son did. Why did he do it? Why? You don't have a clue? No idea. Do you know why somebody would embrace Islam? I'm only an invite. I'm only listening. <laughs> that excuse works once only. <laughs> yep. Why would somebody go to any other religion? Why? Believe it's a true one. Let me share with you something. Some years ago, I tried to stop a friend of mine from smoking cigarettes. I've always had this thing about smoking. I don't like it. And he's a little guy, okay? And I figured, okay. We take when you put a cigarette down in an ashtray, we push it out. Me and another guy would so we put a cigarette out. He just light another. So then we tried to take the cigarettes out of his pocket. He had more I had a whole case under his desk. Pull them out what you call a carton, right? Then he had another. Finally we reached over and took one out of his mouth. Unbelievable as it may sound, this gentleman threw me and my friend both. Me against the wall and him down on the ground. Boom, boom, like that. We were shocked. How this guy could do that, you know? He's not like working out, he's not a karate champ or something. Then he said, straightened himself up and he said, shall I tell you why people smoke cigarettes? I said, yeah, they're addicted. He said, no. I said, because they think they look cool. He said, no. Nope. People smoke because they want to. The same reason that people do whatever they do is because they want to. That's why they do it. So the reason why somebody would leave one thing to another is because that's what they want to do. So the only real question is, what is the motivator behind the desire? What's the motivator? Because they saw something they liked better than what they had. And that's the case of everything that we do in our life. When we leave one thing for another thing, it's because we thought it would be better for us. People hesitate, really, to get married because they're concerned, if I leave what I got as an unmarried person, to get married, what will I really get out of it? Hmm? But then when they get married and they have problems, then they think, well, I don't think about divorce because I'm leaving debt and maybe it'll become worse. So these things go through our mind and we have to make choices all the time. 
And religion is no different. People choose based on what's their feeling and their emotions. And that's why people do what people do. It's really simple psychology. What we want to know, though, from this question is, why would you want to go to Islam? If it's because of the snappy dress, okay, I can understand that. Like the cool clothes. Maybe you like to grow the beard. Not the ladies, by the way. <laughs> oh, you can't wonder. I don't care. But the, <laughs> the point that we're making is that people that come to Islam almost always tell me the same thing. Their reason behind it is because they believe there really is God. And they believe this is the way that God wants them to worship Him. And that's exactly the idea behind the message itself. It's not just to believe in God, but to worship God on His terms, not what you make up or somebody else makes up. So this is why in Islam we really don't have clergy. There are some who would like you to think that, some imams and some of the muftis and that. But the reality is, each one of us is on our, is on our own, really, in front of Almighty God. In fact, our Prophet Islam told us that every single man is the imam for his own house. What do you think it means? Well, yeah, it means he's going to leave the Salah in his own house, for sure. But also, he's responsible for himself and his family, what he believes and what he teaches to his family, his children. So if you really believe that Islam is right, that means you believe in God. And, that the, and if you believe in God like Muslims do, you realize that he has the ultimate authority over everything. And although... The second thing after God and His Messenger is to give the full respect to the family and obey the family, the father and mother. It's not over God. So if your parents would have you to do something that is not according to Islam, then you're not allowed to do that. But anything else you obey them in except that. And the proof is not just from that. <coughs> the proof is from the Quran itself in chapter 31, which is Surah Luqman, verses, I think it starts around 14 and runs to 22. The month, I may be off on the numbers a bit, but if you look in that area, you'll find the advice that Luqman gives to his son, his own son, telling his own son to worship God without partners and obey your parents. Well, that's good for my father telling his son, except where the parents would have you worship something of which you have no knowledge, only God alone. That's it. So if you really believe in God and you want to serve Him, then you've got a choice to make. The Hadith says whoever tries to please people at the expense of displeasing God, God's already displeased, and He'll make the people displeased anyway. But whoever is trying to please God then even at the expense of displeasing the people, God's pleased with you, and he'll make the people be pleased in the final analysis. So I leave it to you to decide what you want to do, because it's not for me to get between you and God, or me to get between you and your parents, or your relatives, or your family. But the reality is that, when it comes down to it, even it's important in Islam, family's number one in Islam. You don't, don't worry about your neighbor not being a Muslim if you're not taking care of your own family. That's very important. But if your family uh, telling you to worship something else or they're refusing, well then you've done your best. And you can't force anybody. So there you go. This is another one about family. What's the best way to inform the family, parents about Islam? Well, Believe it or not, the best, best way is through sign language. How many of you know what I meant? How many of you know what I meant? No, I didn't mean that. Exactly. Because if they see the signs of Islam in you, you are honest, you don't lie, you're fair, you don't cheat, you're uh, respectful. You're clean in all that you do, in your body, and that's a very important thing about cleanliness in Islam. And you're very conservative with things. You don't waste things. All of the things that we today make a big deal out of have been around for 1,400 years. 
Prophet Islam, for example, told us, don't waste water. They said, what do you mean? He said, even if you're making your ablution, your woo-woo, in a river, don't waste the water. Wow! And look at what we do today. I don't want you to go look in the flooded area over here because you can skate in there in the water. Let your actions carry your message. That's as beautiful as you can get. Many people are pleased with the character of a person first and then they want to look at what does this guy do for a living or where does he live and things about it because I like this guy's way, you know. I became very interested in the Mormon church because of the actions of the Mormons. Very clean, nice people. And they detest smoking. Well, I got along with them good. You know? Now, if we have another question here, ask about the farqa, or separation, sex in Islam, like it says, Shiites, Ahmadiyyas, etc., changing the Quran to match their teachings. Well, first of all, if you're a Muslim, you're a Muslim. And that's very important. If you're not, you're not. You can say you are, but that won't make you be one. Being a Muslim is about what you believe and what you do. And if you said somebody changed the Quran, you can't change the Quran. They might try to change how they look at it, but everybody knows what the Quran is. We've got over 20 million people memorized it exactly the same way. If one oddball comes up and he says, no, it's only a short version that I have, or if you drop this word out, or even one letter out, okay, <laughs> he's a screwball, get out of here. So they can't change it. As far as those groups go, though, Allah told us in the Quran, Ya yuladina amnu utaqala haqqa tukati hi wa la tamu tumi iluwaan tu muslimun wa artasimu bihadillahi jami'a wa la tafas. And here, in the meaning of it, it's in Surah Al-Muran, chapter 3, verse 102, in the beginning of verse 103. All you who believe, you come to the faith of Islam, you believe in Allah, that all you who believe have taqwa for Allah. This is the a shield against Allah's anger or punishment by protecting yourself with good deeds, prayers, things like this. And give God His rights, which is to worship Him without any partners. Then it says, and don't die except in a state of submission and surrender and peace with your Lord. Aslam. Then it continues saying, and wa that. Hold tight to the hub, the rope or the cable of Allah. Hold tight to it and don't separate. And what is the cable of Allah? Well, some of the scholars' uh, opinions, this was the Quran. Some opinions is it's the way of Islam itself, Quran and the Sunnah. Others have said that this is the brotherhood of Islam. Regardless, you can see that this is something important in Islam, and but the key comes at the end, Wallah Tafarafu. Don't make Farafa. Don't separate. Don't separate. Don't separate. The first thing to do when you want to separate or divide your enemy up, you know, divide and conquer, the first thing you want to do is what? Huh? Get them to turn against each other on something simple. Not something big, something real simple. Right? And how do you do that? And by the way, British are the best at that. I'm sorry. But they are the greatest at turning people against themselves. Is that true or false? Anybody heard of a place called India? <laughs> Thank you. So you know that what happens when you come in and you say, uh, you know, you guys, not saying it, but... You guys really seem to have it together. I mean, you, you look like, I mean, you tall guys here. You're the, you know, you short guys. You really got it together over here. Why is it? What's my, what's, you know, those short guys over there? So you have the tall and the short Indians suddenly against each other. True or false? Or something else. How about skin color? Has anybody ever used that? <laughs> Huh? Have you heard the word colored? Anybody heard that word before? Colored? 
When I was a kid, by the way, my parents weren't into all that stuff, okay? So when we moved to Texas, when we moved down to Texas, it's 1940s, okay? Still had a little flavor there, okay? When my dad stopped at a truck stop to get fuel, <clears throat> they told us kids to go to the back. You know, you take kids to go to the back and do the trip. So I go back in there and I said, and it says, men, women, right? <coughs> color. Hey, colored, okay, that's cool. I want to see color. Technicolor was just coming out at that time. I went, yeah, it's not good color in here. <laughs> You understand what it means? But you heard people say white and colored. Because it said white. And we saw that. But if a person's really white, well, that's, that's white, right? If a person is that color, I guess they're dead. <laughs> True? I think everybody has color in their skin. Yeah? It's called blood is running through there, hopefully. <laughs> Our prophet Sassanam didn't use that word, abya, white. He used the word atma, red. You know that. Because he said there is no Arab over a non-Arab. And there's no non-Arab over an Arab. And then the translator says, and there's no white over a black or a black over white. It doesn't say that. It says there's no red. Because they actually considered people like me, to be red people. Because you know what happens when we're out in the sun, what color do we get? <laughs> yeah, right, you got it. So racism is a bad thing too. But if you know about what I just said, then what should the bottom line be about dividing up into groups? And there's no way you can avoid it unless you do one thing. Go look in the Quran and see what did Allah say. Allah named us what? It's right there. And it doesn't rhyme with goofies. It doesn't. And it doesn't rhyme with goonies. Huh? You know I'm talking about. He said, it is Allah who named you Muslims. So if you want to be a Muslim, be a Muslim and leave all that stuff alone. That's my advice to me. <laughs> Say, so when you converted, how much did your daily life change? A lot. One of the things that's very important is getting up in the morning on time before the sun comes up and getting all wet. And on these cold days, <laughs> it's kind of hard, isn't it? And then praying. You know? says, when you became a Muslim, what did your wife say? She said, I shadow a la ilai la la, I shadow Muhammad Rasulullah. It says, please elaborate. The reason she said that, because she was also convinced long before the event itself that we needed to enter Islam. So it was not a hard sell. It says, best way to control your anger. I don't know! <laughs> <laughs> the prophet, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us how in really bad anger is. Uh, somebody once asked me, advise me, give me advice. He said to him, La Tagdab. Now, Tagdab comes from Ladab, and Ladab is a word, Hyrule Magdubi. Magdubi has that in it. It means wrath. Anger. So he said, La dug dug. Don't become wrathful. Don't get angry. So he said, Give me more advice. La dug dug. And more? La dug dug. And more? La dug dug. Don't get angry. Don't become angry. Don't get wrathful. Don't get so bent out of shape. You know? Don't be like that. But then he gave us advice on how do you control that. Well, one of the things is if you're standing up, <laughs> you know. Sit down. <clears throat> Another good advice, real good advice, make wudu. That cold water will snap you out of it in a hurry. <laughs> really. 
Because he told us that the devil, and we know in the Quran that the devil are from the jinn, and the jinn are made from a smokeless fire. And when there's one around you, you get hot, you get seething. I am so angry, I am hot. And why? Because there's a shaitan. Make a little. Okay, now let's call the locksmith and see if we can get the keys out of the car. <laughs> Doesn't it get you angry? Huh? Slam the door. Oh! Snap! There's my keys in there. <laughs> this one said, uh, Hinduism have one god. The other gods are aspects of something. And now Christianity may have the same something with the three trinity. Is there a confusion with the belief system of Christianity when Maybe they use it, something, something Trinity. Um, just the tip here, if anybody would like to sign up for a class in Trinity. <laughs> oh. Where did the word Trinity stem from? Is it a word you just believe in? That needs a whole, uh, there's a book we have on this subject, but uh, simply put, Trinity... It's tri, T-R-I, that's like you have a mono, duo, and tri. Trinity is three. And at the time of the Nicaea Council, it was very much accepted to use this term, and from that period forward, for those who wanted to go along with it from the influence of the Emperor of Rome at that time, which was Constantine, because they had a triune government, and this gave a nice balance to it. And at that time, Christianity, up until that time, had been an object of, um, not an object of affection, that's for sure, an object of uh, the wrath, really, of the Roman Empire. They used to throw the Christians to the lions. They used to have gladiators just tear those poor Christians apart. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even talked about it to some extent, saying that they would rake their skin off with iron combs. And, of course, leave them to die. And another thing that they would do is beat them, whip them, or even cut them in half with a sword. So the Christians suffered heavily for their belief in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until there was an agreement and a structure made between the the Roman Empire and a sect of Christianity that they were able to end that because that particular sect became the new religion of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at that time had a church called the Roman Universal Church and that had been in business even before Jesus was born. Some say even all the way back to Alexander the Great which would have been like maybe 300 and something B.C. And there was a lot of influence at the Nicaea Council coming from different opinions. But what they landed on and settled for, one of the things was the changing of the date of the birth of Christ, history of Pony, to become the 25th of December. That fell in line with a the, with the god that was a Roman god called the Mithras. By the way, I pulled this off of one of the Catholic websites, so the one where I got it from. But it's also in the Encyclopedia Britannica or Encyclopedia Americana, which that's the one I do. Anyhow, just to let you know that you can read a lot about it there. The idea is presented in many different forms depending on who you ask about it. If you ask a Protestant who has Trinity, they may have a whole different take than a Catholic who has a Trinity. But all of them will come back and say, well, it's just one. But the incorporation of God the Father, God the Son, and, and then the Holy Ghost somehow becomes a part of the God as well. In Islam, we have 99 characteristics of God. True or false? <coughs> but all of them are just about God as being absolute and perfect in every format. There's nothing in any of the characteristics of the law that leave any room for interpretation of something less than absolute. He is the peace, 
It doesn't mean he has peace. He is the peace. There's no peace in the universe except it has to emanate from him. He is the knowledge. There's no knowledge in the universe. It'll be Mashah, except what he puts in it. This you'll find in um, Ayat of Percy. Most of you memorize Ayat of Percy, right? How many memorize Ayat of Percy? Wait a minute. Almost everybody in the room, Marshall Ball. The rest of us, we need to work on it, huh? So, Yalamu ma bena eidihim wa ma khafum wa la yudun bi shayim min dumi hi ilu bi mashah. It's very clear that Allah says He has all knowledge of everything and you don't have any except He gives it to you. So He is, and Bion is the word in here, He is the what? Alim. So somebody could be Abdul Alim, that means the slave of the all knowing. And the same is true of all of His characteristics. He is the absolute and the perfect and He doesn't share any of it with His creation. Now that's where the difference would come between our understanding of what's called uh, monotheism or tawhid and what some other churches or beliefs would have because they don't mind to share that with something in the creation, whereas we can't. Because Allah is alcoholic, which means He is the creator and He's never in the makhluk, which is the creation. You cannot be alcoholic and also be in the creation at the same time. It wouldn't work. He's the absolute and only creator. So if you understand these concepts, it becomes a lot easier to explain to somebody who has some ideas different than what we have. And we leave it for God, of course, to guide the people in the way that he wants them guided. And then he's going to be the judge on the day of judgment anyway. True or false? Our job is, exactly the job that we just talked about in our speech, is the message. Jesus brought a message. Abraham brought a message. Moses brought a message. David brought a message. Every single prophet brought a message. The message is worship God alone without any partners. Know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And you have to worship Him with all your heart and all your might and all your strength. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. No other God beside me. Beside me there's no other God. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. And in, I'm asking a lot of, wake up my brain, there's a passage I want to quote to you from the, it's at the end of the Old Testament. I remember the verse, but I can't remember the, uh, it's like chapter 16, verse 4, but I can't remember the name of the, the chapter, the uh, book. Anyway, it says, I'm the Lord your God. Beside whom there's no other God. Beside me there's no other Savior. That's in the Old Testament. So this is exactly what we have in Islam. This is very clear. There's one God. You worship Him. And if you want salvation, you turn to Him and you repent Him. There's a difference. We didn't ask about this, but there's a difference also in Islam about salvation. As Muslims, we believe for sure that every one of these prophets was a savior in the sense that he brought you the message of salvation. But not that we would pray to him to get it, but rather to the one that he prayed to. So, if Moses prayed, I want to know who he prayed to. If Abraham prayed, who did he pray to? If Jesus <coughs> prayed, who did he pray to? And let's cut out the middle man and pray straight to the one who prayed. This is the concept we have in this plan. The only ones that are going to really get upset with comparing Islam to Christianity are those who are being threatened by a different belief. So if a Muslim is upset with Christians, maybe he's threatened by the belief. And you should get over it. I'm talking to Muslims. Get over it. His belief or her belief shouldn't affect you. And if it's somebody you really care about and you think that you need to help them, then ask them, can we talk about it? And if they go, no, my mind is made up. In case you don't know no in English, we can give it to you in several other languages. We have Lao, we have Lamb, we have, you know, No Way Jose, that's Spanish. Texas Spanish. <laughs> It means leave me alone. And the same for Christians. If you think, well, these guys, they don't have the right belief. Still, 
Take it easy. Because at the end of the day, it is really your relationship with the Lord. And if He wants you to be guided, it's simple. Just ask Him, God, guide me. It's all you got to do. God, guide me. And then whatever He guides you to do, okay. Because He'll ask you on the day of judgment, not me and not anybody else. That's my message to me. We spoke about anger. We spoke about the wrath. We talked about getting over it. One of the things you have to learn about people is you don't control people. It's not that you control anybody. You think you can control your kids, but they'll get over that, and they'll get older, and they'll get even. They'll make you nuts. Don't do it. <laughs> he used to tell us that we know that insanity is heredity, hereditary. Now, you catch it from your kids. But in Islam, and I want to close with this one thing, and then we'll talk about the good questions we have. In Islam, we learn something very valuable. That after God and His messenger, the parents have all the rights. All the rights. So you obey your parents. You take care of your parents. And you look up to them, and you provide for them, and you do everything you can for your parents. And then God, He's going to really love you for that. But whoever disrespects their parents and treats them bad, Allah is not even going to look at them on the day that You lost it. All your prayers and all your fasting are down the toilet. Because you didn't take care of your parents. And there's one other little thing I like to remind the children when they ask me for advice. I tell them, take good care of your parents. Because the Lord's going to give you kids just like it. <laughs> so let's remember that. Make your offer your parents. Most of them you know that's important anyway, whether your parents are living or not living anymore. Do make your offer your parents. Pray for them and ask the Lord to make life easy for them and make you a better child to your parents. Because that is very, very important. I close with that, and I'll tell you how we can get these rest of the questions very good. I'd like for the uh, organizers to collect them up and be sure that I get it from these before I leave. And also, if you'd like to write to us, you can do so very easily. You can write to us at contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, -C -T, contact at guyus.tv and please be patient it sometimes takes up to a week or more for us to get an answer back but after a month if you don't get one send it out to us and we'll try our best to answer everybody I had a great time being here in Middlesbrough and it was uh, a good chance really for all of us I think to learn a little bit more about each other's religion I would like to mention now this is kind of like a commercial I would like to mention to you about Guidance TV this is something that we have in America. It's the first and only voice we've ever had for Islam in America. This television channel was started exactly two years and three months and one day ago. And when we started it up, we didn't know how long we could keep it on the air. It's already had fantastic impact on so many people. We went from about, we started with around 2,000. Before long, we had like 20, 25,000. Today, we have over 2 million viewers every day watching our channel, according to the estimates that they give us. This channel is on the satellite, and we just put it on another frequency. We also added a local channel in Columbus, Ohio. It's over the airwaves. That means anybody has a TV set, you can turn it on and see it. You don't need the satellite dish. You don't have to buy anything, it's there, and we're planning on putting this all over the United States. The effect that it's had, we've already been contacted by politicians who would like to come over and uh, congratulate the Muslims on their new channel. <laughs> <laughs> and vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> we've also had offers of people that want to advertise their products. Unfortunately for them, we refuse. We don't take any kind of ads or commercial interest whatsoever. I don't want our channel influenced by anything. Not a politician, and not a product, and nor anybody with big money. Also, these some countries we know have some money. Yeah, we know about that. But we don't want that. Unless one, one thing, let me share with you. I make a dua when, when I ask the law in the night, don't give us any money except what comes from your bottle, which in, in English is kind of like your blessings. 
and don't give us any people except your loved ones. So if you guys would like to join along with us, you can do so. Go to valueus.tv slash join. Now we need more volunteers to help us get the message out and how to use it. Join us in our chat room on chatislam.com. And if you would like to financially support, you can also do that. You can go to guideus.tv slash donate. Or you can talk to the brothers here because they've got some information about it. We lost it. It's not out there tonight. I don't know what happened. But inshallah, they'll make it available to you so you can see how you can do that. We have a plan. I wasn't supposed to tell anybody about it, but if we're able to continue what we started over here, I started Guidance TV here in the UK, you don't know that, about two years ago as well. And now we have this resource, the studio, the equipment, and real close to the final thing, which is the broadcast antenna. If I get that, if I finish it off, Within the next eight to nine months, we're going to have guided TV broadcasting all over the UK and the, and the northern part of Europe. Inshallah. So I hope you'll take a chance to look at it. Right now, you can watch it anywhere in the world if you have the internet, iPhone, smartphone, but not dumb phone.